Then I give the floor to the students and the teacher of Regenburg. Okay, thank you Crystal and good morning to everybody. High performance and especially quantum computing is not taught at German schools today, at least not yet. Um, actually, this is, okay, this is the first slide. Um, however, last year I had the opportunity to visit Crystal's group in Jülich for a three-day internship where I got a crash course in quantum computing. Back at school, I shared my knowledge with these three very clever students. So they came up with a problem and solved it on a quantum annealer themselves. So I think that's the reason why we are here today. There are not many so young students, pupils who work with a D-Wave yet. But before we come to the work of the students, let me just show you what it takes to program a quantum annealer. So, of course, it's necessary to have a deep understanding of quantum mechanics. You have to be able to solve the Schrödinger equation, the time dependence Schrödinger equation, and be familiar with entanglement and superposition of quantum states. Then you have to be an expert in mathematics. You should know how to solve um, linear algebra equations to handle quantum bits on a block sphere, as well as be able to deal with complex number statistics when you work with quantum registers. And finally, if you are searching for employees, students, or as in my case, pupils, that will do the hard work for you and program a quantum annealer, you have to look for some, yeah, let's say, super intelligent nerds, with, which can be easily detected by the strange t-shirts they usually wear. <laughs> so, do you believe me? Is the teacher telling you the truth? Fortunately, it turns out that for a quantum annealer, all this is fake news. <laughs> it's definitely not so complicated. As Crystal told us before, quantum computers are or will be in the near future experts in solving optimization problems. So all you have to do is to set up an objective function that returns a value, a cost value, for every possible candidate solution. For programming a quantum annealer, this boils down to find a matrix that represents your problem. I will not explain how this matrix is set up, as this is the part of my students who will take over this part in two minutes. But you should keep in mind, as you see, there are no complex numbers, no fancy mathematics, and no Schrodinger cats lurking around the corner. You just have to feed your matrix into a quantum manila, and this machine returns several solutions of which you choose the one with the lowest energy. How all this was done for the N-Queen's problem, how this matrix was set up for this problem, will be shown to you by my students, Paul, Jakov, and Jonathan themselves. So stay tuned, the best part is still to come. So as you already heard, we're Jonathan, Jacob and Paul, 16, 15 and 15 years old and we all go to the grammar school of the Regensburger Domspatzen, the school of a famous boys choir from Bavaria, where we also visit the boarding school that belongs to the choir. And we solve the N-Queen's problem and a few other optimizations problems on a D-Wave machine. The N-Queen's problem is the, is the problem of placing N chess queens on an N times N chess board so that no two queens threaten each other. For example, placing four queens on a four times four chessboard following the problem rules. A chess queen is able to move vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. A solution requires that no two queens are located in the same row, column, or diagonal. This would be an example of a wrong solution because the two queens here and the two queens here th 
uh, threatening each other. This one is a right solution, for example. We are going to explain the whole way from the problem to the cost function on the example of the four queens problem. What we are looking for when solving an optimization problem on a D-wave is a cost function that returns an evaluation of every possible situation in form of a value, and that's equally minimal for all solutions of the handled problem. On the way to this cost function, we first have to define logical rules resulting from the problem being chosen to solve. In our case, the N Queens problem, the first problem we solved on the adiabatic quantum needle. In the case of the N Queens problem, these logical rules are quite simple. On every row has to be exactly one queen, because if one row is missing a queen, there has to be another row that is double occupied because of the missing queen standing there. The same applies to the columns. In contrast to this, on a single diagonal, a queen isn't strictly necessary. It's impossible to place a queen on every diagonal when trying to find a solution, because there are two n minus one diagonals, but only n queens. From this follows that on a diagonal can be placed a queen, but doesn't have to. I'm now handing over to Paul, who will explain how we brought these rules to the quantum manila. After defining the logical rules, we have to formulate them mathematically. We have to break our final cost function down into smaller components by defining cost functions for smaller parts of the chessboard, such as rows, columns, and diagonals. Let's start with the first row that consists of the fields A, B, C, and D. First, we add up the values of the four fields, zero for empty and one for occupied. When we now insert values into the function, we find out that it has its minimum at x equals zero. That's why we subtract one after adding the field values up. After subtracting one, the function is still minimal for exactly one queen, eh, for zero queens on the row, so for an empty row. That's not what we want. But we're now able to change that by squaring the whole function. As you can see, the function's global minimum is at x equals one now. That means the function is minimal for exactly one queen on the row, and we already got the first part of our final cost function. The same applies to all other rows and also columns, respectively the fields belonging to them. The, 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 the diagonal specific cost function works quite similar. We just have to take into account that the diagonal can be empty, contrary to a row or column. Therefore, the cost function for the diagonals has to have minima at both x equals one and x equals zero. So we subtract the half, the middle of the values zero and one. Here you can see the whole cost function, consisting of all the diagonal, column, and row specific cost functions we opened up before. When we expand that term, we receive multiple combinations, each being composed of a coefficient and two letters, for example, two AK. Finally, we have to translate this term into a matrix, an upper triangular matrix more specifically, that the D-Wave expects as input. Two AK stands for two at the position AK in the matrix. The values in the matrix created from this process are also logically understandable. Every positive value greater than zero depicts a penalty, and every value less than zero represents a reward for the case both qubits are one, while zero itself has no influence. The fields A and K are located in the same row. From this follows that it isn't allowed that both of them are occupied by the same time, because the queens on them would threaten each other. We can find a penalty for that case at the position AK in the matrix. You may have noticed that the diagonal of the matrix is minus two all over. The problem with without it is that we get a perfect solution when zero queens are set and the chessboard is empty because if there aren't any chess queens, they can't manage each other. The reward makes it attractive for the annealer to place queens on the board, but only as long as there aren't too many queens set because the penalty for an additional queen set is always bigger than the reward earns for it. Hence, we ideally get a solution for n queens on the board, not less and not more. We now want to execute our problem on the quantum computer. To do that, we first have to generate the embedding, the interconnection of the single qubits, by throwing our problem-specific matrix into D-Wave's Oceans SDK and letting it manage this part of the work for us. The embedding is sent to D-Wave servers in Canada that transfer the embedding information to the quantum leader itself. After computing, the values of all the qubits are measured and sent back to us. We receive various results because we execute the same matrix about 10,000 times what isn't a problem for the reason that one run only takes about 20 microseconds. The structure of the results and back is always the same. On the left, you can read off the results energy, in the middle it's frequency, and on the right, the qubits values. This structure can depend on how you decode the data coming back. 
We also designed a graphical user interface that makes it possible to easily select and run a problem on a D-Wave without having to master Python scripts or terminals. It is also able to decode the binary information we get back, what's getting more important for bigger and more complex problems like Sudoku's or the Nystor problem, whose solutions are barely human readable. Besides the M Queens problem, we solved a few other problems, including the Knights Tool problem, then Amazon's problem, and 4 times 4 Sudokus. The Knights Tool problem is about finding a sequence of moves of a knight on a chessboard so that the knight visits every square exactly once. These moves are possible for a knight. Here you can see a possible solution for the Knights Tool problem. The N. Emerson's problem is very similar to the M. Queen's problem. Amazons are part of the fairy chess and they combine the moving abilities of a queen and a knight. I assume that most of you are familiar with Sudokus. We were only able to solve 4 times 4 Sudokus because of the restrictions on the problem size caused by the shortage of qubits we faced. Sudokus are much more complex to formulate as cubo problem than the, than the problems we solved before. So far, we had only two possible states for each square, occupied and not occupied. For Sudokus, one qubit isn't enough to depict all five possible 4 times 4 Sudoku values. One, two, three, four, and empty. You can see that every problem revealed new difficulties when it came to formulating it in a way the quantum Manila can understand. Every new problem was also a new challenge for us. With our project, we took part in Jugendforscht, the leading and most popular science and technology competition for students in Germany, in which more than 1,250 students participated this year. At the competition, Every project has its own booth with posters and things like experimental setups or a screen presentation. There's a jury for every subject area evaluating the project after listening to a short presentation and reading the scientific documentation. There are two age categories. Pupils until the age of 14 years can take part in the first age category that is called Schüler Experimentieren, in English, Students Experiment. The second is called Jugendforscht, in English, Yaoth researchers, and it's possible to attend until the eighth age of 20. Furthermore, there are three levels, starting with the regional competitions, more than 60 in Germany, the state competitions, Bavaria for example, and finally the nationwide level, the competition for whole Germany. To get to the next level, a first prize is required. The competition is again divided into seven fields, biology, chemistry, physics, world of work, Mathematics, Informatics, Earth and Space Sciences, and Technology. Jugendforsch is outstanding because, especially at the nationwide level, competition is a great event. There was a program with many attractions, like a guided tour through laboratories or the magnificent special prize giving. It was also great to meet, meet like minded people and get in contact with scientists. The food at the competition was really delicious, including this strawberry cake. <laughs> This year we took part in the field of mathematics and computer science and won our first prize in the Bavarian competition, a fourth prize in the German-wide competition and the special prize of Federal Ministry of Education and Research for a project about future-oriented technologies. At all, it was a great experience working on a scientific project and seeing it being appreciated by real scientists. Because of our success, we were invited to give a talk at Cronus and we recently presented our project at the MPQ, the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Munich. Apart from this, the five best projects in every subject, including us, are invited to come to Berlin in autumn to meet Angela Merkel. If you are further interested in what we did, we would like to invite you to our website, where you can download our scientific documentation and our posters. Thank you for your attention. Please feel free to ask questions. <laughs> So 
thank you very much. So are there questions from the audience for the teacher or to how they are also called in the meantime, quantum voice? <laughs> I, I think you, <clears throat> you guys you did a fantastic job, right? And uh, I, uh, um, you know, I also went to school in Regensburg, so what we call um, the Abitur in Germany at the end of high school. So I had to do this in uh, Regensburg as well. So I know the site, and I, uh, I would have liked to have access to such a machine. And uh, let me add a comment, because this is so encouraging. It's so encouraging, and I think we have to thank the organizers that you were able and invited to present here yeah, at, at ISC. It is so encouraging because at the same time, a few weeks ago, we had a big discussion about the mass examinations, right, in the middle of the year. And there was a lady, I will not tell you what her name is, from the public, uh, um, uh, uh, our educational system who asked the question, should we have examinations in mass in future at all? So that, that actually caused desperation. I think you guys, you give us a lot of hope. Thank you. Thank you.